I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier chair here at CSIS. I don't think I have to introduce uh, Andrew Natsios uh, to this audience. He's a former aid administrator. He uh, was also the former special envoy uh, for Sudan. And you also, um, we want to hear about what you've been doing. Uh, you were a professor at Georgetown, and you have, a, you have a new life, and we want to talk about that as well. But before we do that, I want to just recognize a, 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 there are a lot of Foreign Service officers, current and former Foreign Service officers in the room, but I want to particularly take a moment to recognize Senator Luger, who's here. Uh, and I think we should welcome Senator Luger. Thank you for being here. Can we move this back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, I think it speaks volumes, Andrew, that you can uh, fill a room uh, on pretty short notice, uh, and I think speaks to the uh, reserve of goodwill you have uh, with foreign service officers, with uh, folks who care about international development, um, and I think it's reflected here in the in the diverse and uh, the diverse and strong audience that we have here today. Could you? I got several. I had several kind of open-ended questions I wanted to put to you, and then I wanted to open up to this very thoughtful audience. Could you first tell us? Uh, so, tell what are you doing today, and where where are you today? <laughs> Uh, well, I've been talking for eight hours at a conference in the Middle East. I'm not going to talk no, about it. No, don't do here. that. I'm not going to do uh, And then tomorrow, uh, uh, Jeff Greco has arranged a talk at uh, CID being Fifth, held at uh, the 15th and L. 15th right, and L at 10 a.m. CGD on uh, the crisis in East Africa. I wrote uh, two articles uh, in July. I was up in Maine. The, the, the first one was published. It's a very long essay on what's happened in South Sudan. And then that stimulated the New York Times, which called me and said, would you do an essay for us, a op-ed for us? And I said, you used to pay a lot of money for <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> Things have changed. But anyway, but, I, I said, I'll do it for free. But more Times. existentially, you're, yes. at, you're at Texas A&M. Yeah, I teach uh, at the George H.W. Bush School of Government at Texas A&M. College Station. College Station, Texas. You know the, the fighting Aggies. <laughs> Now I know where the audience is. Uh, and i uh, also director of the Scowcroft Institute. President Bush's best friend, of course, is Brent Scowcroft. Uh, the school is only 17 years old, and the Scowcroft Institute, I think, is seven years old. We are now ranked in the upper 13% of schools of public policy in the United States. I think it's according to US News or one of those indices. Uh, and it's, and, and the, for, the, for the first time, we got into the top 25 foreign policy schools in the uh, foreign policy uh, rankings that are done. SBA. Yes, uh, so we, were, we didn't rank very high, but first time, we're only 17 years old. I might add, we are the best deal going. It's $15,000 a year uh, over two years, you know, for two years, $30,000. I don't want to tell you what my former school, Georgetown, where I taught for six years, is at this point. But we deliberately, uh, try to keep the price down. Everybody goes, gets a scholarship. And uh, we did that deliberately because President Bush said he does not want, he's 90, 91 years old now, he does not want people leaving the school with heavy debt. If they're gonna go into public service and 85 to 95% of our students get uh, positions in the public sector. Uh, we are favored for a number of federal agencies. For, I won't mention all of the federal agencies, but AID, we have a whole bunch of people from uh, uh, the Bush School at AID, State Department, DOD, and of course, the other agency on the other side of the Potomac. So, uh, and the, the whole focus of it is not putting people in investment banks in New York City. No offense to New York. Uh, it is public service or the NGO nonprofit world or the aid contractors or so. If any of you come from an institution that wants to have an intern next summer, free intern next summer, please call me. Um, my students are, I teach a course in international development theory I, I and practice. I took two of them. You yes, made me an did. offer I couldn't refuse. Thank you very much. <laughs> And, uh, and they we were have, excellent. We have a lot of foreign students, by the way, from all over the world. We have two Afghan students this year. Uh, and I run the Scowcroft Institute. We have a new initiative called GP3, Global Pandemic Policy Program. The I wanted we, to ask you about yes, that. We call it a program because it does not require the approval of the Board of Regents, which takes two years. <laughs> it's a very long process to do it. And I wanted to do this quickly. I was so 
nervous by reading the great influenza of John Barry. Just before you do that, yes. you have a conference you're doing on. Yes, next week. Next week on yes. pandemics that and I'm going now, to. Uh, it's, it was supposed to be capped at 60. They called me today and said, Andrew, it's 75. I don't know where we could put the rest of the people. I said, I thought you told me we weren't going to accept anymore. He said, well, if you saw the list, we cannot say no. And these are mostly federal officials coming from a whole series of federal uh, agencies, domestic and foreign. And, and why are you doing this conference? Well, uh, there aren't a lot of places, there are a lot of places focused in public health schools on infectious disease. We are focused on pandemics. And uh, uh, Gates recently gave a speech in which he said, uh, uh, Bob Gates, that uh, the event that will be the black swan event to change history will be a worldwide pandemic. 1918, people think the worst catastrophe of the 20th century was the Second World War. In terms of human life, that is not accurate. It was the pandemic of 1918, the great influenza. We now believe that the 90 million dollar, 90 person death rate is a serious underestimate. It killed 5% of the world's population in a year. It had catastrophic consequences. We have a house up in Maine. And are I we want, prepared for the next We pandemic? are not prepared at all. The federal government is not prepared domestically. The international system is not prepared. And we are focused on policy reform. This is not a gotcha program. It has nothing to do with partisanship. We are going to try to go through methodically and propose a series of mechanical reform, sometimes more than mechanical, to fix the system so that if we have this happen, we can stop it before it gets out of control. Just one fact from AID. We did have a pandemic in 2009 of avian flu, but it did not mutate to have high death rates. It was, in fact, it killed very few people comparatively. If it had mutated, we would have had unimaginable catastrophe. Two billion people got the avian flu in 2009 within six months. That's how fast it spread. It is the most efficient of all of the viruses. AI, uh, President Bush was so nervous, he read the this same book. 2000, 2009, I think it was nine it happened. 2008, nine? Well, somewhere around. They, they don't time pandemics around presidential elections, as yeah, I'm yeah, sure yeah. you know. But, but what did happen is President Bush 10 years ago got so nervous by reading John Barry. By the way, John Barry, is, who wrote the best selling book, The Great Influenza, is our guest keynote speaker. Next week. He's, he's very excited. He's staying for the, for the round tables where we will elicit, solicit. Uh, reforms, proposals, and changes from these technical experts around the government. And we have people, at, we have six scholarly papers, two professors from GW uh, are offering uh, reform, papers in terms of looking at reforms. And we will publish the papers as Scowcroft policy papers. We will then issue a policy, we're having a fight now within the staff as to whether it will be a series of papers or one paper on what the, the, these changes should be in the international system. And we're not prepared domestically either. I did not realize when you saw the uh, furor over how many people got Ebola in the United States? Two dozen? Max? It, it, was, it, it really caused a sensation in the United States. Imagine if that were 10,000 or 20,000 what Good it would Lord. do. So, uh, and this is, we're gonna have annual, we call it a summit. We're gonna have a summit every year from now on. We have uh, funding and uh, we're getting very senior level interest in this within the university and within the foundation world to start. In fact, I'm nervous we cannot spend the money that's beginning to come in. Uh, so anyway, we're, we're working on that. Let me cover a couple other things. I wanna make sure we get to, to some of the thoughtful audience questions I'm sure we're gonna have. Um, you, when you became aid administrator, you set up a bureau called Economic Growth, Agriculture, and Trade. You were early on agriculture, and obviously with Senator Luger here, and one of the, the, the pillars of Senator Luger's work at the Luger Center is on agriculture and food security. CSIS has a strong food security program that was started in 2007. So you wrote an article in 2009 called The Coming Food Coups. This was after the food price spikes, but before some of the political instability that was related to agriculture changes in, in food prices. Could you talk about agriculture, how important it is to development, and, and how we should be thinking about it? Well, when I, I wrote the article, and I didn't do all these correlations economists do, so I, I'm not tethered by the scholarly disciplines. You have to have correlations and code all of this stuff, which the political scientists and economists love to do. I simply said, I've done this for 25 years, and I can tell you when there's a famine, there is panic, and there's uprisings, there's coups, 
Uh, and in fact, there, there is uh, just evidence from the media of governments being overthrown because of the sp price spikes in 2007 and 8. And so I went through what would happen if this continued and then what the geostrategic consequences would be. What is not widely known is one of the major factors leading to the uh, Japanese entering World War II or attacking us was food insecure, severe food insecure. There were starvation deaths in Japan in the 1930s. Most people don't know that. Not in Germany, but in Japan. And uh, there's a, a book out I would commend to you. It's a very long book by a brilliant uh, British uh, uh, historian, Lizzie Collingham, called The Taste of Food. And it's about the use of food in World War II, its connection to the Holocaust. I did not realize the Germans intended to kill the Nazis, a hundred million Slavs and Jews and gypsies to reduce the food, the feeding of people so they could take that food and feed Germany because they had lost the First World War because of food insecurity. They were worried they couldn't feed the German population. It's very disturbing. This is not just a matter of hunger. This has very severe strategic consequences. The thing that I am worried about is the most conservative estimates are between now, 35 years, and 2050, we have to increase food production by 50%. The more upper end estimates that come from the FAO are 100%. Now, I'm not an advocate of the Council on Rome. I'm not a neo-Malthusian. I'm the opposite. However, there is a limit to how many launch land there is in the world. And unless we use scientific agriculture, we are not going to be able to increase food production by 50% in the next 35 years. Would you care to explain what you mean by scientific agriculture? Yes, I'm talking about GMO food and seed, and I'm not talking about any particular companies. Some of this, AID did work on uh, genetic material that was public. It was not controlled by any corporation. We made it available in Africa. Uh, I, uh, and we started laboratories in several countries in Africa for them to develop their own, uh, to speed up the production of improved seed varieties to increase food production. It does not solve everything, but it, seed production and, and seed um, technology increased food productivity in the last 35 years by 50% of the developing world. 50% improvement in agricultural poor countries, because, mainly because of the Green Revolution of 40 years. I think we need to, that and many other things, but it can't be simply Neolithic agriculture modernized slightly. We need large farms and we need small farms. We need to help all, because we'll never get to the amount of food we need. And we do not want food becoming a factor in causing an international war, which makes me nervous. Andrew, you um, built on uh, the great work that Brian Atwood did in the Clinton administration on democracy promotion and democracy and governance. You're, we're going to the IRI dinner tonight. Um, can you talk about the importance of democracy promotion and good governance as it relates to development? I don't like the word democracy promotion. That's not an AID term. We, it, it, that is a term used by some scholars. State Department uses it, the White House, any White House uses it. It's a development program. Uh, the four pillars, by the way, of the AID democracy have been, remained the same since the late 1990s through several administrations. So it's withstood the test of time. Our strategy, it's become more sophisticated. But people associate democracy only with elections. We now know from what's going on in, in, in Russia. Russia has elections, right? They have a Duma. Would you call Russia a democracy? <laughs> of course not. It's, the Russians call it a managed democracy. I mean, there are other less complimentary terms than that. It is, we, we are confusing elections with democratic practice, and that's not what it's about. The, I'm not going to go through the whole strategy, but there's a lot more complexity to it. And the most important factor is it takes a long time. The problem with this city, the bubble that surrounds the city, which is one reason I left, the bubble hasn't extended to College Station, Texas yet, is everybody wants immediate results. They want quarterly indicators. I'm fed up with quarterly indicators in development programs because a good development program takes 10 to 20 years. The old AID had 20-year programs and projects. For example, we had a linkages program with India, 1951, even before AID as it is currently formed was created. But we had an aid program in India, 1951, 1971. I read the evaluation, by the way, after the program ended, and it said it's not a very good program. These institutes, 13 engineering schools that we uh, linked Indian engine, and we helped build the schools, are not working very well. There's patronage, there's corruption, they're not that competent. Guess where the IT revolution in India is now? 
at those schools. It has been a spectacular success, but it took 50 years. Does that mean because we didn't have quarterly indicators? You know what would have happened now if we had that project? Two years later, OMB would have shut the program down. Why? No quarterly indicators. In fact, even at the end of 20 years, we didn't have indicators. We are so obsessed with short-term uh, results and indicators, and it's, it's OMB, it's the GAO, it's the IG, it's the special IGs, which are the worst in my view in insisting on this, some of the congressional oversight committees, uh, and it is the news media obsessed with short-term gain. If it's short-term, it's not a gain in most cases. That's the problem. Institutions take a long time to mature, as the case in India, and you know, there's been really no effort to record all this. I had to go through these old evaluations on the, in the AID archives to find the evaluations that said the linkages program was a failure or didn't work very well. No one would say that now if you look back at what's really happened. So I would like to propose, John Sobrello, if he's here, he's here. He has been pushing the, the idea of an aid historian. He is absolutely correct. We need an aid historian with staff, just like the State Department has. When I left as envoy to Sudan, they interviewed me for hours. And there's a long record of all of the nuances of what we did. Is there, there are three million documents in the AID archives, but it's not easy to get to them. John has proposed that we have a historian that records in enormous detail this stuff for archival purposes so that one, we don't keep doing the same thing over and over, it doesn't work. And if it does work, we need to learn the kind of lesson we learned from what I just mentioned in India. So you alluded to um, what you've described as the counter bureaucracy. You did a, a best-selling paper with our friends at the Center for Global Development. I'm sure many of the people in this audience have read your paper on the rise of the counter bureaucracy. <laughs> I think that came out in 2009. It was a bestseller when I was at the World Bank. It whizzed all over the, the World Bank group. People read it very carefully. Could you just talk a, bit, a little bit further about what is the counter-bureaucracy and what is your objection to the counter-bureaucracy? Well, I, I was given the credit for inventing the term. I did not invent the term. That's from this political science literature. And uh, I think it was a professor at Georgetown who invented the term, who, who studies this. No one, however, has ever applied it. And I didn't know this because I did not do what these, they call literature searches. You have to study everything before you can write anything. You know? So I just said, I haven't read anything on it and I need to get this out. So uh, the counter bureaucracy has been building in size and power over the last 30, 40 years by successive pres presidents to control the federal government because the only elected officers in the federal government on the executive side are the president and the vice president. And the fear was that with two people in charge, you can, no, no president can actually control a, billion, a million people with this massive budget. So I understand why they created, I ran the counter bureaucracy in Massachusetts and my friend John Simon who's sitting here was one of my deputies there. I was secretary of minister. I, I don't criticize the need for some executive control over the bureaucracy, but it's out of control. I mean, and the question is who is regulating the regulators? Who tells the IG, and I don't mean the USAID IG, who I think is more reasonable, without mentioning names, there are other IGs. Who tells them that their press releases have nothing to do with the audits they issue? They say sensationalist things that are not accurate. What do you, when they write something in an audit that's complete nonsense, what's the appeal process? There's no appeal process. They can write anything they want to. So my question is who's, who's in charge of the regulators? There is no one in charge. And that's the problem because I think they're out of control and they are doing damage, not just to AID, but to many federal agencies. It's particularly problematic in a development agency that requires long time periods for the maturation of programs. Let me give you one example. Uh, uh, we commissioned a report through the National Academy of Science and through two universities, uh, v Vanderbilt and um, Carnegie Mellon, on a retrospective on 20 years of AID develop government, uh, democracy and governance programming. And they did a regression looking at 20 years of programs, billions of dollars all over the world, and the Freedom House indicators of good governance. It's quite fascinating because people were saying these programs are ineffective. And what the report found was rigorously done by political scientists that we had no control over. The first finding was fascinating. One is there is a moderately robust relationship between AID spending money in these programs and an improvement in the indicators. 
Freedom there, House indicators. Freedom House indicators and good governance and democracy. Second, the indicator improvement often does not take place until after the program ends. In fact, ends for several years. So you have a program for 10 years, but you don't have 10 years, it's hard to get a 10 year program now, but this was over 20 years when we actually did things like that before, okay? It takes 12 years before you can actually see an improvement. And then what they noted is there's successive increases, improvements in the indicators without the program being in effect. In other words, there is a time lag problem just as there was in India. I don't know if there's any literature on this, but I'm, just, I'm looking at through the old aid archives, there is a time lag issue and the counter bureaucracy is not interested in time lags. They're interested in what quarterly basis you can produce as indicators. And these indicators are not indicative of anything. 90% of these indicators are output indicators. They count how many people went to a training session. They're not outcome indicators. And those of you, are all most of you are development professors, there's a big difference. I did an evaluation for the German Marshall Fund of the Balkan Fund for Democracy. Balkan Trust for Democracy. Yes, and Balkan Fund for Democracy, the German Marshall Fund runs with AID and a bunch of other donors. And I did it myself when I was at Georgetown. I went to the Balkans and I interviewed dozens of people and I wrote this long report. What I was astonished at is the amount of data they collected. And I said, why did you collect this data is useless? They said, we were told we had to co correct, collect this. AID made us do it. And then I asked the people, why did you make them? He said, well, the IG wants to know the production. I said, so you've educated now at two week seminars, 8,554 people over a, a nine year period. Uh, what significance is that? It's useless. Does the program work? No. Do we know whether they took that knowledge and did anything differently? Absolutely not. It's hard to do that, okay? So a lot of the indicators that are being used to shut programs down aren't even outcome indicators. They're output indicators. And they're not particularly useful, and we're making irrational budget decisions based on, based on that. Two more questions, and I'll open it up. Um, could you talk about, as you look at over the next five years, what do you think are the biggest development challenges on the horizon? And related to that is what should a, how, how should the next president, Republican or Democrat, how should they, or what development priorities should the next president have? Uh, well, I'm gonna to mention tomorrow a major challenge in the Horn of Africa, and that's the issue of water. But I'm gonna to get to that tomorrow at my talk. On 10 o'clock at Sid Washington, oh, 15th right. and L. Right. Now, I wanna mention here eight reforms. And I propose that these eight reforms be submitted as a formal legislator for 12 years in the Massachusetts House. I know you can do this. You don't have to have a complete rewrite of the Foreign Assistance Act. Senator Luger repeatedly tried to get that through. By the way, the biggest loss for me personally and for the development was his un unfortunate retirement from the U.S. Senate because he was one of our best supporters and actually paid attention and understood these issues. But I propose these be individual bills one line bills, you don't need to amend very much, okay? Now I'm gonna go through these quickly and I may write an essay. In fact, most of these are in this book I'm writing on foreign aid that's, I finished the conclusion finally in Maine this summer of the final chapter. We would love to do a book, yes. book launch for you. When, when will the book be published? Well, I haven't gone to a publisher. Publish, I want a commercial publisher because I want someone to actually commercially to um, publicize the okay. book for once. Anyway, first, the evidence is that in patrimonial states or clientele states, which are based on, on patronage networks, personal relationships are the only way in which decisions are made. That's how decision, that's Max Weber's famous definition of patrimonial state. Most fragile and failing states are patrimonial or clientele states. What do we do in those states? We put our foreign service in state and AID, but there for one year. Well, that's genius. Okay, the shortest terms are in the state and the countries we need the longest presence by individual. Having a foreign service officer change every year, that's not a personal relationship. A personal relationship is eight years. You can sh shift in Brazil or Botswana who the foreign service is because they've got a lot of institutions and you don't actually have to have personal relationships to get things done. It's nice to have them, but it's not essential. In South Sudan, it is absolutely essential if you want to have influence. Now, if you don't want to have influence, you want your projects to fail, go ahead and do what we're doing now, which is one year assignments, and then in the stable states, we do three years plus one year. We need to amend the Foreign, Assist the Foreign Service Act, 
the Foreign Service Act, to change the law to allow eight-year assignments. And do we need a special cadre for complicated states? Yes, we do. States? For a failing and failed state, we need to train a separate cadre of Foreign Service and AID, but I must, might also add in the State Department. People who go in expecting to live fairly rugged lives. Now, those of you who have joined me in some of my trips or who have lived in the development, and know it's, if you're in a civil war, the electricity goes out, if there's any electricity, you have to be able to accept that. We have a whole cadre of people in OFDA and OTI and Food for Peace that do that. We need development officers who can do that on a large scale, which we don't have now. Two, we need to redefine OE, uh, operating expense money, which is very thin, not to include any money spent in the field in the missions. If it's spent in the missions, it's not OE. Anything spent in Washington, it's OE. And I adjust the budget. Why? That will force all the money out to the field. Now why am I proposing that? In fact, all of, many of these are decentralizing efforts. Dan Honig is a professor, assistant professor of political science right down the street here at our AID's old rival, I mean uh, Georgetown's old rival. It's actually the rival of ours at the Bush School too, Sice. His name is Dan Honig. H-O-N-I-G. He's published an a extraordinary study. I, I told him he did, should do a book. I had dinner with him last night. He looked at 8,000 development projects from a whole half a dozen different development agencies. And then he looked at the degree of authority that the program officers who manage these projects in the field had over the project. Do they get out to see the project once a week? And do they have any authority to change the direction of the project without getting approval from Washington or everybody and his uncle? And OMB and the IG and the Congressional Oversight Committees and St. Peter and everybody else, okay? And he found a high correlation for success if you decentralize a lot of authority to the project managers in the field to make the decisions without having everybody and his uncle approve this. The more centralized the program, the greater the risk of failure. And he did this across the whole world for 8,000 projects. The conclusion is pretty strong, and I went through them last, I said that means that the old AID, which used to have that kind of authority, needs to be reinstated, which means we need to rescind the rescission of the authority of AID office to spend money. I don't know if you know this, but from the, the end of the Bush administration, or just at the end of the Bush administration, back to the Carter administration, uh, officers at the field level could, start, could make changes in the budget within federal law, uh, which was rescinded when the F office was created at state. Now, I understand why they did it, because they wanted to control the money in the F office. Now, the regional bureaus in the State Department revolted when this happened, okay? The problem is that decentralization is exactly the opposite of what is happening in our pro in many respects. And by the way, this is all being driven by the counter bureaucracy. The reason state did the F office, and I had the hand in creating it, unfortunately, very unfortunately, um, is because the county bureaucracy said, you're not coordinated, you know, the 3Ds don't have an integrated program. Actually, the more integrated the program is, my findings are, the less successful the programs are. Because there are many things they want us to do in DOD and state and NSC and, and Congress that don't work. And AID needs to say, I'm sorry, this has never worked anywhere. Why are you telling us to do this? We're very reluctant to do that because we're marginalized bureaucratically. A uh, third, uh, or fourth, uh, all aid spending should go through AID. All spending by domestic agencies should go through AID. Now, people will say, well, why would you do a thing like that? Richard Nixon did it, believe it or not, when he was president of the United States. He ordered OMB to say, we need someone some agency to oversee, because OMB can't do it, neither can the State Department, neither can, who can do it? The development agency. If AID wants the Department of the Interior to do a parks program, that's fine, but AID can shut the program off if it's not working. We used to do that, we stopped doing it. Now everybody does their own thing, and who is auditing, by the way, all the domestic agencies in the field to see if these projects they are running work? No one is auditing them because IGs from domestic agencies do not go into the middle of civil wars or unstable states. The only IG that does that is the AID IG. Maybe state is beginning to do it, and these special IGs they keep appointing. I mentioned the, uh, the aid historian. Let me mention one last thing. 
In AID, people don't know this. Preeta McPherson got it through during the Ethiopian famine. You can, it's called a borrowing authority. It's really not borrowing because we never pay it back. Uh, he, the administrative AID in the IDA account, the International Disaster can move up to $50 million in any year out of other AID accounts into the IDA account legally. You have to tell the Congress and all that, but they can do that. And so if we had a surge, we didn't have to go back to Congress for money, we had the borrowing authority. I propose that something like that be established for all mission directors uh, in the missions, that they can move money from existing accounts in their budget into an, un and they'd have to get approval from Washington to do it. But we need more flexibility in these sectoral accounts where we're spending too much money in other accounts where we're not spending anything, even though everyone in the country wants something done in a particular area. Okay. Why don't we open it up? I suspect you've uh, uh, you said some things that I think are going to elicit a, a, a reaction. So I thank you for that. Perfect. Uh, I'll take hands. Otherwise, I'll, I'll call on folks. I'm going to see if, if, if Senator Luger, if you wanted to say something, I'm, I'm really, we're really pleased you're here. The microphone is here. We'd, we'd love it if you wanted to, to make a comment. I was uh, very much moved by your thought on the food process that genetically modified organisms really have to be a part of that situation. Uh, as a, a farmer with corn and soybeans in my 604 acres out in Indiana, I, I saw from the time that my dad was getting 50 bushels to the acre to the time last year we got 192 on the same land. Amazing. But with different seed fertilizer, different soil management situations. Uh, and so even if, if this huge change has to occur, 50%, 100%, it can occur. I've seen in my own lifetime on my own farm. Uh, the, the difficulty is, uh, as you know, European countries take a very dim view of GMO. They've influenced African countries that are badly in need of food. Uh, so the battle goes on worldwide. Uh, what, what contribution can AID make or any other agency of government uh, to accelerate understanding of this, uh, even in our own country, quite apart from elsewhere? I have to tell you who convinced me we needed to do this was the career staff at AID. People may think I imposed this on AID, they imposed it on me. They came to me and said, if we don't do this, Andrew, we're not going to be able to meet the, the dietary needs of these countries. Almost all of our scientists, economists and uh, uh, hard scientists were strongly in favor of this. Now, a lot of this has been politicized because of the European Union. They've told ministers in Africa outrageous things. If you eat genetically modified food, it will change your DNA. They told the Minister of, Agric the Minister of Science and Technology in Mozambique that, and Andrew, he said, Andrew, is that true? I said, there's no empirical evidence that that's true, and I'm not a scientist, but I asked, I call all the scientists in, am I telling people things that aren't true? They said, no, Andrew, there is no evidence. What, if you do not change species, in other words, you, you're, you're, you're improving one corn variety with another corn variety, Okay? You're doing the same thing we do when we do hybrids, when we do improved varieties. All you're doing is speeding up the process. It used to take 10 years to do it. Now you can do it in a year and a half or two years with GMO seed. So within certain constraints, there is not the kind of risk people think there are. And then he said, the Europeans also told us, that you put pig genes into your corn, and we have 20% of our population is Muslim, so they're being told all your food aid has pigs in it. Is that true? And I said, where do you hear these things from? There's no animal DNA in any grain produced in the United States. I mean, you can disagree with GMO, but don't lie about it. It's nonsense. And I said, who told you that? They said, merchants from Europe want to shut the United States out of uh, markets in Europe and, and Africa, and they're telling people that. And I said, well, we're in the middle of a drought. People are hungry. <laughs> You're telling me we can't distribute food aid because of politics? It's a little disturbing in my view. So I completely agree with you, Senator. What we did do is Emmy Simmons, who was the assistant administrator, and she's an uh, economist, uh, a career person. She was our chief agricultural economist in Andy. They had meetings of, of the agriculture ministers, and they issued statements endorsing GMO research that would be controlled by Africans for their own purposes. And we supported it in terms of, um, I think Senator Bond had an earmark in for GMO research of 35 million, 32 million dollars or something like that. So we carefully used that money to do more research and build the capacity up in the developing world to do their own research for their own seed varieties. T 
Tony Carroll. Andrew, on, on this stage, but at the old location, just after you had uh, finished as administrator, you talked about the uh, constraints of earmarks and how you really only have a very limited amount of budget to spend. And I'm wondering if the situation in the last uh, 10 or 12 years has changed, and do you have any recommendations on sort of positive legislation that might be able to evade some of those constraints? Let me, let me get a couple. Let me get my friend from Interaction back there. Thank you, Dan. I'm Lindsay Coates from Interaction. Thank you, uh, Andrew Nasios. It's great. The bubble has never consumed you, even when you were living in the bubble. The bubble has <laughs> never consumed you. Um, I'm interested in all the remarks you made that around um, the devolution of power to USAID staff and the field. How do, far does that in, extend, in your mind, to the devolution of power for local countries, and how much authority should should they have an alignment with they, should they have around how USA dollars are spent? In the old USAID, even before, there were three, you know, people think Jack Kennedy created the foreign, Harry Truman created the foreign aid program, and then Eisenhower expanded it, and they merged the agencies, and the, and the, and the agency staff in the early 60s were actually people who ran the Marshall Plan, I don't know if you know that, that's where they came from. So they weren't new, but they were in a new agency. Okay? In the old days, I examined the, and I talked to, Fred Sheck was in the old AID, and he, he couldn't believe the stuff that the new aid looked like when he came back to be deputy. And he said, Andrew, this was a negotiating process, the development process. In the old days, we had enormous authority in the field, and the Minister of Finance would come in and say, we want to do this. And he would say, well, we've tried this in every country in, in Latin America. It does not work. Tell me how you're going to do it differently so it will work. And they would negotiate it, and then they, the minister would say, well, we don't want it to fail here, so tell us what didn't work and how can we change it. So they would negotiate. They can't do that now. The FAR, the Federal Acquisition Regulations, it's, it's a straitjacket. So, so, and then you have to create these indicators. You have all the sectoral earmarks. The old days, and still to some degree now, it used to be that the ministers were in AID's office, the cabinet minister, all the time. The African heads of state actually told me, he said, Andrew, my top advisor in development is the AID mission director. I call the mission director all the time, even at home, and ask, is this, some good, is this guy corrupt? Should I fire him? Because I don't really trust the system to tell me what's really going on. And serious people who are heads of state would use the aid mission director. Now, and they used to go and say, I need help in this area. Can you put it? And they used to be able to say, we have enough discretion. If you want a program in this area, you tell me what you want, and we'll design it together. Let, they let can't me, do that now. Let me just, if, maybe just if I can, on, on Lindsay's point, I want to make sure that we get to Tony's question. But uh, you were involved with the Paris Declaration in 2005, and there's a whole discussion around country ownership. And I think that has animated a whole lot of, I think, I'm sure Lindsay's had a lot of work related to the issue of country ownership over the last five years. And I think there's been a debate in Washington about what does country ownership mean? Does, and uh, I see my friend Betsy Basson back there who helped uh, us do some work here at CSIS on this question of, okay, should, does country ownership mean we should do straight budget support? Does that, is that equal country ownership? Should, how, how should we actually deliver assistance is sort of a question that's embedded in this concept of country ownership. When you signed the Paris Declaration in 2005, what, what was your intention of that? Because the debate in Washington since then has morphed into the Paris Accra Busan Global Partnership, and that yes. all equals just run the money through our pipes, and that equals capacity. It is not building. what the original intention was, and I didn't help me. I led the delegation that, where we signed that. Okay, that was not the original intention. And I have to tell you the reality. The reality is you have ministers coming to AID and, and say privately, never publicly, please do not put this into our treasury. Then we have all these political pressures to hire more people that we don't need or for patronage purposes for the parliament. Do not do it. We had, I, I had a yelling match on this issue with Claire Short, the former minister of, of um, the uh, UK, Diffid. Diffid. This was in 1982 in front of President, uh, uh, Prime 2002. Minister. 2002. What did I say? 2002 in Addis in front of the Prime Minister of Ethiopia. And the Minister of Finance from Nigeria was sitting there, and I said, do you, do you want us to send all this? And, and he actually said, and this is off the record, he's out of office, I can't remember his name anyway, he said, actually, we think we would prefer you sending the aid project. We like the aid projects, we have to approve them all, and we helped design this in the old days where we had more discretion. 
don't send us the cash. Claire got livid. She was yelling at him and at me. The, for a saying, while, the Brits had sort of a theological fixation yeah, that's on this. I think that's now. moved since. They can't but. find where the money went in Afghanistan. I told them not to do it. They've reduced budget support by 40%. Now, I think we need to go through more local institutions, but we cannot use the, the counter bureaucracy as a mechanism for judging, because I'll tell you, they'll flunk. They don't write a lot of paper in these countries. They can't write all these indicators, design all these projects with the demands of the IG and the GAO and everybody else and his uncle in this city. They can't do it. And expecting them to means AID is going to be in trouble. They're going to be in trouble and we're going to get embarrassed. So, so let me come back to Tony's question about earmarks. Uh, and I think it implies something about the executive branch and congressional relations as opposed as it relates yes. to development. We used to have a lot, of dis a lot more discretionary money. And one of the reasons we did is we double counted. When I wanted to have complete transparency, and I've written this in my book, and I want some aid officer to tell me it's not true, but privately saying, Andrew, you're right. They said, don't do this. Do not install the new financial management system that is completely transparent where it's very hard to do double counting. You know what I mean by double counting? You count an earmark for microfinance for 275 million. 50 million of it is microfinance for agriculture. It also, hand we don't have an agriculture earmark. I wish we did when I was aid administrator, but you can count it both twice. Okay, now the congressional staffs knew what we were doing and they would wink and nod because they knew that they were in a straitjacket. We were in a straitjacket and they knew they caused it, but they wanted flexibility so we could move money where the country wants it being spent. I asked an aid officer recently, they said actually we appropriate, we, we have more earmarks now that we cannot double count than there's money appropriated. And it's become a ludicrous. It's become ludicrous. There is no discretionary money. And it's not that we're playing games. There is no discretionary money. Now, I know why they have the earmarks, just to get support. You know, people think these are earmarks for specific institutions. There are almost no specific institutions getting here. There are no bridges to nowhere in tech in, a, in the A budget like they had in Alaska, OK? These are earmarks for specific programs. And they're not bad programs. The problem is. Congress does not know, neither does OMB, how much we actually need based on field requests. The old AID still suffers under the delusion that when the missions ask for money, we have this rational process, we aggregate all the demands, and that's how we set, that's not how we set the figures. Congress decides how much an OMB and the White House, how much we're going to get. They have nothing to do with what all the requests are from the field. And those field requests are based on what the ministries want. And civil society comes in and says, we need more training in this area. We put it in the budget, goes to Washington. They dump it in the, I was going to say in the toilet, but I, they dump it in the wastebasket. Why is that? Interest group pressure, media pressure, presidential statements by all presidents. I mean, I understand why they do it. There is a way to fix it with incrementally without abolishing all the, because you can't abolish the earmarks. They're attached interest groups and some of us are in the room, you know. So um, what you could do is this borrowing authority. Tell the mission directors that they can take money out of an earmark legally and move it 10% of their budget every year. Could go, it's already been appropriate and allocated for the country, it can be moved into a new program, has to be approved by Washington, has to be designed locally, has to be approved by the ministers and the government or the prime minister. Let me, let me get some folks from over here. I see uh, two folks in this section. I want to be geographically balanced in my calling on questions so no one can say I wasn't, wasn't fair and balanced. So that one and that one. Brandon, tell them where you got your education. Texas A&M University, sir. Um, you, know, you know I work in AIDS budget shop right now, currently. Yes. Um, question for you, sir. Um, one of the end goals and inevitabilities of foreign assistance is the rise of other donors. And now we no longer have traditional Western donors. We now have Middle Eastern donors, the Japanese, the Chinese, the Indians, that kind of thing. So in a specific area like Sudan, South Sudan, as you're an expert on, how do you either counter, supplement, or complement different styles of foreign assistance in such a geopolitical, ge geopolitically sensitive area? And let me just color commentary on that. I think there's a before and after the the emergence of the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. I think certainly in Washington and other European capitals, I think that has been a, an absolute wake-up call that we now have a, what I would describe as a geostrategic competitor for soft power. So I think to, to, to the gentleman's point. Whose sovereign debt is being increased 
by the borrowing done by the new bank? China's or their, its own entity? Because if it's China's, I don't think they're going to be out borrowing so much money anymore, but we'll see. I think what they're doing is they're trying to deploy it's something like petrodollars when the Saudis uh, had, I, had dollars sitting in their reserves and how do we deploy this money? They wanted to, but know, they're in essence doing their, it's, it's sort of like recycling petrodollars for infrastructure are projects. You aware it's also that, a WPA where they can deploy, yeah, they need to yeah. employ 20 million Chinese every year that enter the, the labor we, force. We are entering a period of enormous... Um, instability in the international system, financially, militarily, and diplomatically. And the system is coming apart. The World Bank's in very serious trouble because they used to take a quarter of a percent interest rates to fund the bank, and they don't have the income anymore to do that. And so they've been cutting. There was an effort to cut back the CGIAR, which I was shocked at. And, and it's why? They don't have the money. They don't have the money. So the whole system is becoming more fluid. I'm not sure that's going to happen. The Saudis have a deficit for the first time in many years right now because of the drop in oil prices. Wow. And they are cutting back. So I'm not sure we're going to see this trend. I could be wrong. We'll see. We'll see. Do we need to be aware that there are other things? Now, I just want to say one thing. The Chinese have met a need that we weren't meeting except for the MCC. Now, the first few years of the MCC, I don't know what it is now, 70% of the projects that were being designed by people in the developing world were infrastructure projects. We don't fund infrastructure except in Afghanistan and Iraq. Why? Well, there are many lobby groups in this city, many advocacy groups that say infrastructure is very bad. I mean, we don't want infrastructure. We don't want any roads. Dams are bad. We don't want ports. You know, there'll be more commerce and then we'll cut down the rain for. I mean, there's, there is opposition to infrastructure, and that's why we stopped funding it. There is a study that shows the banks stopped funding, the precipitous decline in infrastructure funding. Why did the MCC get all these infrastructure proposals? Because there's a demand for them. Why are the Chinese now? And why are they being welcomed with open arms? That's because they're willing to do it and we're not. We need to re-examine just why we're doing some of the things we're doing. You, you sent me this paper by a guy, uh, Lance Pritchard, is that his name? Yeah, Lance Pritchett. Yes, Pritchett. I liked that paper a lot. It was on, are we really good partners? That, that the electorates are, I think, how did he describe it? It was on, it was the U.S. and Euro, Western European electorates that support development have, I think, I don't want to put words in his mouth, was have a postmodern set of values and therefore what we want to offer developing countries does not comport necessarily with, with what, what developing want. countries want. I might add, if we... And so we, there's a, becoming an increasing mismatch yes, is what his point exactly. is. If we did to ourselves what we're doing to develop in terms of money, we would not be a developed country right now. We would be back in the Neolithic period. We wouldn't have any roads. There'd be no canals. We wouldn't have infrastructure. There wouldn't have been a lot of economic growth. Uh, I have to tell you, just look at what, how the United States developed. So I, might, I want to make sure this gentleman, the, the glasses in the back there. Thanks, Dan. Uh, hi, Andrew. Carl Hoffman. How are um, you, Carl? Good. Nice to see you. I'm the president of PSI, Population Services International. With the exception of USAID, what is the bilateral or multilateral donor agency that you admire most? I hope you're going to say Australia because my friends from the Australian Embassy are here. <laughs> and the foreign minister came, we're going to publish a paper about what an excellent statement the, the foreign minister has about the central role of the private sector in development. So I hope your answer is the Australian development program. Well, I can't tell, I'm, I'm not really hedging this. I don't know because changes have taken place. The Australian aid program was subsumed by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which I think was a mistake. Canada, it's happened in. The only independent aid agency now, I think, is Sweden and Britain now. Aid ID is still theoretically organizationally independent, but it really isn't anymore. Uh, aid administrator cannot but, but who, money But who around. do you admire in well, terms of their I'll work? tell you what Dan Honig's research showed, is that it used to be DFID was jealous of us. I had DFID officers 10 years ago saying, I wish we had the authority in the field you had. Because we did a study in uh, Senegal uh, the AID mission director had an accounting firm, big accounting firm, do a study on how long it took, how many of the eight, nine decisions made in the program development process could be made locally without approval of Washington or New York or the capitals. And they looked at the World Bank, AID, the EU, uh, DFID, et cetera. And there were, I think it was eight or nine development agencies. 
we were by far the most decentralized. That is all shifted. This was done in 2003, I think it was. It's, it's shifting dramatically in the opposite direction. So DFID used to be jealous of us because we were so decentralized. Mission directors could actually say to a prime minister, I promise you I will get this done. They can't do that now. And people complain in the contractor community, the NGOs, why are these missions? It's because the rules have changed. They don't have the authority anymore to, to, to make those decisions, which I think is a major mistake. If you want to have development power in the best meaning of the word power, to influence the development in a constructive way with our partners in the developing world, you need to give the ambassadors and the mission directors authority in the field instead of having all these decisions being made in capital, capitals who don't, they've never been to the countries. I love these people making decisions who've never been to Africa before. That's genius, you know? We, we've decided in Washington or New York what's best for you even though we've never been on the continent before. Okay. I've got a lot of hands, I know a lot of folks. I need to call on Dr. Golden, who is an affiliate of, of CSIS. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna be able to get to everybody. Right here. Hi, thank you, Nicole Golden. I'm a senior associate here at CSIS, um, teach at GW and former uh, USA senior advisor. She was the author of the youth strategy. I know the strategy. Yes, oh, well, hope you enjoyed it. Um, we've been talking for almost an hour, and it's uh, about development, and I'm just almost surprised that we're about six weeks away from the adoption of the formal adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals. And I am curious for your take on whether they matter, um, why or why not. I could make crude remarks, but I'm, Dan said I have to res restrain my <laughs> comments. Publicly. 17 goals, 169 sub-indicators. You know what it looks like? the Foreign Assistance Act after 40 years. That's what it does, it's what it looks like. Everything is approved because no one can say no to anyone. Can, what about, the, how about the MDGs, the first round of the MDGs? Well, the MDGs, look at the MDGs, because I do a whole block of instruction to my students on this. Is economic growth one of the 10, nine or 10 MD? Now they have them, they have language on it, okay? It's not, it was not part of the MD. The MDGs, are essentially social services and human rights. I support you. I'm co-chairman of the Committee on Human Rights in North Korea with Roberta Cohen. I think human rights is extremely important. I think health programs are very important. I think education programs. But are there any other issues? What about building rural roads? What about productivity in agriculture? Are those? How about employing the youth bulge? Yeah, and how does that relate to local decision making. Now you can say, look, we had all these people, we had 10,000 people come, or how many, 30,000 people go to Korea to make all these decisions. I don't want international bodies making decisions for countries. I want the countries making the decisions because Tanzania may decide to move in a very different direction than Mozambique. Why should we subject that to some international institution? They should make the decision. They go to see the mission director for AID or EU, negotiate something, and do the project. I, they think it was, they, they did these, these, the MDGs, to raise more money. Well, I have to tell you, it did raise more money, but I don't think it was because of the MDGs. But then, after the 2008 financial decline, guess what happened to foreign aid? It's in steep decline. It's not That's an flat. increase. Okay? So, are these MDGs being proposed in order to get more money? Because they haven't been doing that, and they're not going to do it. So it's not producing any more revenue for aid, number one. Number two, there is now an obsession with numbers again. Okay, we're, we're spending an enormous amount of time trying to collect more evidence that the MDGs are being complied with. I've been to some of these countries, and the Minister of Finance will, I said, you really have an increase in the literacy rates of this? And they will wink, okay? There's a book out on bad numbers. There's a professor from the University of Toronto, I believe, who actually began to examine the numbers that are being used by the World Bank and the UN and international institutions about whether they're making progress. James, and the numbers are made up, I have to tell you, or they're, they're fixed. I mean, census numbers are made up in the developing world all the, way, all the time. I mean, it's a very political thing. James Q. Wilson says in his book, Bureaucracy, which has nothing to do with AID, this is principally about domestic agencies he's written. I had him as a professor almost 40 years ago, and this book is the classic work on bureaucracy. And James Q. Wilson says in the book, 
He interviewed officers running domestic programs. He said, they want statistics, we'll give them statistics, even if they're made up. Okay? In the United States, I'm not talking about in Ghana, or, or Ghana wouldn't do it as much, but the Congo. Okay? It depends, it, the notion that the, the, all this data we're getting, this mass amount of data, is all carefully collected and analyzed is simply not true. Now, I'm not saying all of it's not true, but a lot of it's not true. And it is distorting things, and it, it, people play games to collect the data because they think they're going to get more money as a result of it. Andrew, thanks for being with us. I really appreciate you coming. Uh, please join me in thanking Andrew Natsios. Thank you.